I remember going inside and you know, being a young kid and having to watch your mom cry is just like your worst enemy. And I just went over next to her and, and gave her a hug and held her hand and, and just, you know, let her know. I was like, what's going to change? Because she's got to put the boxing gloves back on and it starts today. She knew what was going on and she was okay with it. She wanted me to do what I do because she knew, like, this is my space, this is my sanctuary, this is where I let everything go. Before being drafted in the first round by the Yankees, before winning a college World Series, even before he found his curveball, James Caprillion was just a kid who loved to play sports. I love to compete. I think that's the biggest thing. I'm just a huge competitor. But I think I was forced to grow up at a young age, unfortunately. And with that, being able to play sports was kind of my sanctuary. Uh, where I was able to step away from whatever was happening in reality and in life and in family and school or whatever it is and be able to just go into that moment and uh, just do whatever I can to excel at it. Being able to thrive at something doesn't just happen by chance. James had the perfect foundation for success and it all started in his own home. Doug and Barb Caprillion, it's, it's hard for me now, even when I say those names, I, in my head, in my mind's eye, I can't see Doug without seeing Barb, and I can't see Barb without seeing Doug right next to her. They were a good balance because my dad was always so tough on me, um, even when I didn't want him to be, but I'm so glad he was. And then when I'd complain about it, I'd go to my mom, and she'd open my eyes to the reason why he was being so tough on me. They were the, the picture-perfect parents, super supportive. Doug was super intense. Mom was just, she just loved watching her, her daughter and her son compete in sports. She was his number one fan. She did everything for that kid. You know, she was just uh, one of the most amazing women I've ever met. I mean, in, in every phase. Uh, she was just so caring. You know, she, she meant everything to him. She meant everything to that Caprillion family. My mom was a superstar. She was always, you know, a great fan, a great mother. Um, whether I did good or not, you know, she was always there to give me a big hug afterwards and cheer me up. She was a huge part of my life. Always had the cowbell ringing. Um, always had the cowbell. Anytime things were going good, you heard the cowbell. So, and everyone knew my mom for the cowbell. The cowbell. In the sports world, it's used to stimulate the senses, encourage excitement and create adrenaline. Unfortunately, the Caprillions would feel a completely different type of emotion in February of 2000. They received news that would flip their world upside down. I was in first grade when my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. I didn't know she was capable of dying. I didn't know about chemo. I didn't know if there was going to be surgery. I just knew mom was sick. We always would say, don't let cancer define the way you live your life. And uh, this is just something we're going to deal with. Um, but she was always tough. We never felt like there's any moment where we should be worried or scared. Barb battled. She fought. She went toe to toe with cancer and beat it. Or so they thought. In remission for close to two years, bad news once again resurfaced. So I was in high school, um, getting picked up from school by my mom after football practice. We drive home, park the car, and she just bawled. Um, and she's like, the cancer's back, just found out. Um, so that was a hard moment for me. I remember going inside. And, you know, being a young, a young kid and having to watch your mom cry is 
it's like your worst, it's your worst enemy. And I just went over next to her and, and gave her a hug and held her hand and, and just, you know, let her know. I was like, what's gonna change? Cause you gotta put the boxing gloves back on and it starts, starts today. At first it kind of became the type of deal where I wanted to keep it separate. Um, I didn't want other kids and people to realize what I was going through at home. It, it, James never brought it to school with him. If he was feeling all those things, he either did a great job of hiding it or he did a great job of focusing on what he was going to do at the time. I think part of it was me growing up and I didn't want to be weak, you know, after seeing you know, cancer and, and the radiation and the chemo and all the things that my mom had to go through. Uh, I didn't really want any excuse for me to be weak if she wasn't going to be weak. The baseball field was just always a place where I was able to have fun, smile, play the game, be with friends, and just do what I love. It's a very private spot and it's personal and there was a lot of growth getting to it. I think out on the mound, he could stand out there by himself, be by himself. James internalized his mom's battle with cancer and took it onto the mound with him every time he pitched. High school career here, he's 33 wins and three losses. Even those three times he lost games, it was two to one, one to nothing. But I will say that when James pitched here, I was never nervous, ever. While James relished in his athletic achievements, academics still weighed heavy in the Caprillion household. From a young age, there was always you know, a standard that I needed to do well in school. School came first, and then I'm, I could be a baseball player, a football player, whatever I wanted to be. James was always going to college. That was, that was made very clear to me. It was really a USC family, so it was going to be a tough nut to, to crack. I've, I've always wanted to go to SC since I was a little kid and you know the opportunity at UCLA was just such a good opportunity to play for Coach Savage, uh, compete for a national championship, you know, work towards a degree and I just couldn't, I couldn't turn it down. Backed by a strong work ethic and support from family, the transition to college ball at UCLA was almost too easy for James. He excelled out of the bullpen his freshman year in 2013 helping the Bruins secure their first national championship in school history. Caprillion joined the starting rotation his sophomore year, where he led the Pac-12 in strikeouts. James's early accomplishments led to an opportunity of a lifetime. So from you know, young age, I was like, oh, the best of the best play on Team USA. Like, I gotta, I gotta, you know, I gotta be on that team. So once that you know, opportunity came around, I got the phone call, and told my parents and they knew that you know it was one of my goals so they were so excited for me if I'm able to you know play a sport that I love and represent my country and you know get the chills every time I hear the national anthem I'm gonna take it the good news was suddenly overshadowed by horrible news horrible news that no family ever wants to hear Barb's cancer was deemed terminal I told them all where we have now arrived to. They all kind of, you know, the shock had then hit, and the reality and the denial. I take my dad to the side of the room, and when my mom was occupied or something, and I was like, "Hey, I don't think, uh, I don't think I'm going to play for Team USA." said I didn't think I was going to play for Team USA this year um, just because I wanted to spend time with my mom. Uh, just wait out the last few days and, and see how it goes. Um, and then when the room cleared out, my mom called me back over and she looked at me and she's like, you're going to go play for Team USA. I don't care what you say. just says uh, so much about the person that she was and is um, you know she knew what was going on a 
On June 16, 2014, after a courageous 14-year battle with cancer, Barbara Caprillion passed away. Two days after she passed, he packed up and went to play um, the Worlds. And I took him to the airport, and I, I just looked at him because I, I'm thinking, how are you doing this? And then, a mere 18 days after his mother's passing, James took the mound on the 4th of July. It was different. I mean, it was hard for me to be there at all. I was fortunate enough to get the ball um, against Chinese Taipei. We got to wear the camo uniforms, USA across our chest, and my mom was on my mind every single pitch. And uh, she was out there with me, and you know I wanted to make her, her proud, and um, we ended up having a good game, to say the least. <laughs> He knew in the back of his mind, you know, no matter what was going on, that she wanted that for him no matter what. And I think that's also something that kind of picked that up and, you know, I drove him to go do that. We'll never forget. Best game he ever pitched. And they still tell me uh, with Team USA that July 4th game was one of the best games ever pitched in a USA uniform. And I just know that she was in the stands with the cowbell and it was just all right in front of us. James tossed six shutout innings, struck out 12 batters, and led his team to victory. To say it was an incredible performance, regardless of the circumstances, would be an understatement. To say Barb wasn't watching with her cowbell in hand would be a lie. That's the one reason I started getting emotional. I mean, I just said, if Barb could just see him now, I mean, she'd be so impressed with him, so. He's lived a life, as far as I'm concerned, already. Throwing a baseball, uh, that's nothing compared to the realities of life sometimes. So he, he's a brave kid himself. And I know Barb is, is watching and, and cheering. And like I said, she was a big cowbell person. He knew she was in the house. and. And I know she's, she's clanging those right now and, and cheering for James. The cowbell. To James, the cowbell is a sign of fight, a symbol of courage, an emblem of strength. When I came to UCLA, we have a mental coach here, and we talked about having a focal point. You know, when things go haywire, where do you need to look at, you know, to get your deep breath, slow the game down? Might be the foul pole or the scoreboard. For me, um, it was my mom. It was my mom. And she sat in the same spot every single game. So I knew exactly where she was. Um, so it's always been, you know, that third base side, kind of right above the dugout area. That's my focal point. That's where I step off the mound, look, get a good breath, and it's just kind of a reminder what I'm doing, what's actually going on, challenging myself to be tough and to compete um, in a quick instance, just knowing what my mom went through for 14 years and then stepping back on the mound and taking care of business. And uh, so even though she's not, you know, at my games anymore, that's still the same place I look. You can see more Yankees on Demand and scoreboard content by clicking here. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel right here.